Welcome to the Invention Stories on YouTube. My name is Robert Bear, and today our guest is Richard Browning, the inventor of the flying suit. Website is gravity.co. Please be sure to subscribe, comment, and like. Now let's roll. It's truly my pleasure to interview you because I've always wanted to fly. I've dreamt about it constantly my whole life, and I think out of all the options that are available today, yours is the coolest. It's very kind of you to say uh, you think ours is the coolest. I'm obviously massively biased. Um, I would say, um, I mean, each one, uh, and by each one, I'm, I'm thinking, so Frankie's hoverboard, David's jetpack, Eve's um, and his flying wing, um, and gravity, you know, what we do with our jet suit. I mean, they're all quite different, actually, under the surface. They all have their own pros and cons. Uh, I mean, very, very briefly, um, you know, Frankie's hoverboard, he's gone high and fast, that's for sure. Um, the only thing is that, uh, you know, he claims it took him 300 hours to learn because you've know, got all the thrust under your feet, which is quite a challenge. Um, so that, you know, you, you're kind of top heavy and it's pretty unstable. Um, the biggest Achilles heel with what he's built, though, I would say, and I think he would admit it, um, is he has to land and take off from the same raised platform, that grated meshed platform at about sort of eight, nine feet in the air because the engines are under his feet. And I know about this because the very first time we flew, I had engines on the back of my legs. So my engine nozzles were only three or four inches from the ground. And my God, you can watch it tear up concrete. I mean, literally chip away at concrete. And now, now that the power of the, the airflow drops exponentially with distance. But Frankie's got a problem that he has to operate from that platform, which means for any events, any military, any search and rescue, anything like that, he has to go out and back again or have several of these pre-positioned everywhere. I mean, that for me is a really big downside. Um, and also, I mean, I, I do have a concern. I mean, he, you know, he is, he is a, an amazing athlete. His background was jet ski racing and everything. But I have a concern that, you know, if the un, unexpected failure happens, he tends to fly at an altitude that he's not going to get another go to get back on again. Um, our attitude is we fly at an altitude we would reluctantly accept falling from should there be an unforeseen, you know, incident. It's very hard to eliminate all possible failure scenarios. And what we all do, don't, don't glide. Uh, even Eve's, Eve, even Eve's system won't glide. Um, so we, all of us in our own way try and minimize the risk. And I'd say Frankie does sometimes uh, take a little more risk than the rest of us. I'd say then Dave, Dave has got the traditional jetpack. You know, um, uh, I mean, the, the concept has been around since the what, 70s or 80s or so. Um, he's just upgraded it very well with um, the jet engines rather than peroxide rockets. Uh, but I, I think I'm just trying to understand it because who knows really. But I think it's just slightly too big and more of a system you're strapped to rather than our vision was to try and augment the human body and mind, you know, add the minimalist amount of technology where it really is just you as a human. And I, and I think, you know, most people who see us fly, see a human primarily and then see the technology as a sort of small add on. Um, I, I think sometimes people see David's as just quite big, but I mean, he, he can fly for a pretty long time and stuff. And then finally Eve's, uh, Eve's is a real pioneer. I mean, he's like top down, we're bottom up. You know, he has to traditionally jump out of a helicopter or balloon or whatever, or, or uh, you know, and fire up those engines, and then he's like a powered wingsuit. So, I mean, he's gone higher and further and faster than all of us, but he, again, traditionally has to pull a parachute to land. There are increasing sort of vectored nozzle solutions, but I worry about that because, again, if that goes wrong, you know, you're really in trouble. Anyway, there's a, <laughs> there's a somewhat brief summary of the playing field. But yes, we're clearly very biased and think ours is great. <laughs> I watched your TED Talks. I'm watching it. And one of the things you said was you were never on a skateboard, never a risk taker. What kind of kid I mean, were you? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have to answer that in two phases, really. I mean, one, if you've seen the TED Talk, then, then you, know, you know some of the background, so my sort of family background. Um, yeah, my, my father died when I was 15 and before then I was a very shy only child. I mean, I did go to boarding school, which is a great way of sort of growing up quickly, but I was still not somebody who really relished any kind of risk like that. Actually, when he died, I, I was left with this very strong feeling of go and grab life by the proverbial, you know, undercarriage, uh, and get on and, uh, and go and try and, you know, explore the world. But it's funny. I, I think, you know, a big shock in your childhood can throw you one of two ways. And for me, it really threw me out there and almost like, what's the worst that can happen? Because I can't really imagine many things worse than what I'd just been through. Um, and so I took up rock climbing and canoeing and running and all sorts of things that I'd never thought about doing before. However, all of that said, you're right. I am, I am not naturally some sort of annoying kid that can just jump on a new skateboard, Segway, you know, roll a pair, pick up a pair of rollerblades just for a laugh and be going out the road finding them. You know, there are kids like that. I've had some of my team half my age are like that. Um, I was never that kid. I'm still not. Um, 
I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm honestly really not. Uh, the, the, the inspiration for all this actually came much later in life around my time with the Royal Marines and everything. And actually, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe one of the reasons why so many people can quite quickly now learn to do this is because I had to build it in a way that I could do it. <laughs> so if I can do it, other people, as I've now proven, can literally do this within minutes uh, of learning on our tether. So yeah, I wasn't that kid. I wasn't that crazy risk-taking, mad, lunatic kid that we all usually grew up around knowing at least one. Well, you seem brilliant. So did school come easy to you? Were you a quick study or only when something was interesting to you? <laughs> yeah, good question. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of mildly dyslexic. I don't really know where on the spectrum of that. I mean, I can't spell or write very well. My handwriting's terrible. I'm, I'm a very visual person. I'm useless at languages. I'm, I'm useless at, um, pretty useless at, at, at most sort of English lang language sub subjects. Um, but I really love physics. I really love the you know, design technology. I love sort of mechanical engineering side of things. I love to visualize and move around in three dimensional space a problem. And when you can't do that, like with a language, like learning a list is hell to me, right? If, if there's a reason, if there's a structure I can get to and understand, like the formula in physics, and then I can derive the answer from that, then brilliant. If it's just learning a list, I just find that really hard. So, uh, so it was a sort of story of two halves in a way. You know, some subjects I was terrible at, and I just muddled my best way through, and other subjects came very easy. Um, but yeah, I would never describe myself as particularly academic. Well, as a mechanical engineer and having the mindset of how things work, did you pull apart the TV as a kid? Absolutely. I smashed that little bulb at the back of the cathode ray tube with my face a bit too close to it and felt that sort of suck noise. Uh, felt my, like my eyeballs were coming out. Actually, laughably, my father would give me a big dust sheet uh, and that old TV to go and take apart and didn't tell me anything about the fact that, you know, the capacitors there could still have a massive charge and all sorts of things. You know, I grew up around my father till, you know, say till I lost him, um, uh, learning to build and make and break things, take things apart with him. Um, and I find myself a, sort of applying those skills more and more in what we do than, than, uh, than, than most things I probably learned at school. Hey, but you said you went to boarding school. I mean, parents threaten their kids with boarding school these days. Yeah. Uh, did you freak out when you were told that you had to go to boarding school or did you want to? Um, no, I definitely didn't want to. No, I went at nine, uh, which is pretty young. I mean, there were some kids there that started at seven, which is crazy. Um, I mean, th th there's quite a wide spectrum of boarding school experiences, I think. You know, British boarding schools are quite legendary for being quite kind of Victorian in some ways. Um, my school, it was pretty hard. It was pretty tough. Um, but I, I think I needed it, really. And I, I was one of the lucky kids that came out of it, I think, having benefited from the experience. But it, it's a bit like, you know, joining the Marine Corps. At the time, it's, it's hard work and you can't say you're enjoying yourself. But actually, in hindsight, you actually appreciate, you know, what you learn and what you discover about yourself. Uh, you know, as an only child, I think I benefited a lot because, you know, I suddenly, you know, woke up to find I got, you know, three, four hundred, um, uh, you know, proxy brothers and sisters that I you know, had to get on with. Uh, it, it, the, the, the rationale was simply that my mother had quite a um, high powered job in the city of London, uh, was working crazy hours. And my father was setting up this business um, uh, and was just traveling a lot. And, um, you know, it was just a logical thing in a way. And, and there was a little bit of somewhat traditional old school uh, thinking as well. My mother's family were very sort of uh, traditional naval family um, and that kind of behavior of sending your kids off early to boarding school was quite familiar to them I think. I noticed there's a common thread throughout like everything that I've learned about you and that's like risk management. You think about probability and risk an awful lot. I, it seems to me at least, I don't know if this is accurate, but is that what drew you in, into being an oil trading? Because I saw that you went to school in Wales uh, and you were an ex exploration geologist. Like, uh, <laughs> to me, that yeah. sounds like a nightmare. That's like mining and stuff, right? I mean, were you, did you think you were going to yeah, be a so, miner? No, no. So I, you know, through my sort of, I suppose, the equivalent of high school, I was convinced I wanted to join the forces. I sort of saw the military is the epitome of achievement, of pushing limits, pushing boundaries. You know, the extreme of the journey I described I went on when I was 15 and thereafter of trying to push my own limits. And I sort of, in some kind of Freudian way, I probably was seeing the father figure of the military that, you know, that, that I was probably lacking in a way. Anyway, um, I thought it was all going to be very inspiring and exciting. And I, but I spent a lot of time at university um, actually doing military stuff. And I went to university to do an engineering degree. I have to say, after about one semester, I found it so boring in doing just maths. It was just calculus. I didn't see any lathes or milling machines. They're all the stuff which I associated with actually engineering stuff. And I, and I skipped it. I changed it to exploration geology only because it was a more hands-on science. 
you know, I, I like the big picture, plate tectonics kind of stuff um, and the exploration part at least gave some hint of it being useful for getting a job at the end of it if I decided not to join the military, which is actually what happened because I met my now wife, I mean, this is 20 years ago um, at university and I suddenly thought joining the military as a young man is great if you're single. If you're not single, it's not particularly sociable. So uh, I hunted around for what I could do with my degree and found BP, the oil company, jumped on a graduate scheme and then very quickly found the trading division, which was full of young folks in loud shirts earning millions of dollars. And I thought, actually, I like the look of that compared to, you know, climbing the corporate ladder for 30 years um, and sort of segue my way towards the, tra the trading side. And actually, yes, I, I completely would agree. Um, my trading career taught me a lot about risk management. It's always about not eliminating risk. It's about accepting risk and understanding what is the downside and can you survive it and ironically that's a phrase i find myself repeating a lot in all the keynotes i do around the world because what we do could be very dangerous actually as long as you analyze what's the worst that could happen at every stage uh, and you're happy that you could recover from that you know if you have some sort of injury as long as you're going to be able to get, get over it i mean we haven't thankfully but um we constantly scrutinize that because it's sometimes tempting to think well i can't think think what's going to go wrong i know i'll go to a thousand feet you know get in the way of some airliner this is ridiculous right we'd never do this but you know um we just don't do any of that i mean we do, we barely fly above 50 feet even over water because we just don't see the need there's nothing up there to go and see it, apart from more danger and innovation to me is all about not being afraid to take a risk and try something knowing that most of the time it won't work as long as you can get back up again from those failures, whether it's commercially, you know, running out of money, reputationally, because you do done something stupid, or safety-wise, you know, hurting yourself permanently, as long as you can recover from those three, from in those three perspectives, then crack on. And that's, I, I suppose, the ethos that has been, you know, served, served me pretty well in the last 20 years. Did you have a fear of like how hard the ground can hurt or anything? I mean, did you, did you have any natural fears or anything about that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I still have a healthy kind of, uh, I, I don't have a fear of heights. I mean, I, I don't like, I'm not one of these people who can just, just mindlessly stand on the corner of a building and not feel anything. I, I, I don't enjoy that at all. No, but if, if you remember the clips that you saw on that TED Talk, or you can see it on our YouTube at uh, Gravity Industries or on the Instagram and stuff at uh, Take On Gravity. Um, if you look at those clips, the early development clips, you'll see that it really started with one engine on one arm and then to one on each arm and then two on each arm and jumping around. And so the whole thing was a series of very small baby steps, very close to the ground. And I mean, literally hopping a foot off the ground and down again. And so in a very progressive way, I always stayed, stayed close to the ground. You're right to say that when you start to get enough power to keep going upwards, you're very mindful that within seconds you can be at a, at a dangerously high level. But by then I'd learned this idea of vectoring. So the idea of flaring your arms out, which removes the vertical component of your lift, means you come down again. And we had a kill switch, we have still have a kill switch. You know, and so there was a series of measures in place to just mean that you never were loitering around at 20, 30, 40 feet over concrete, wondering if you were gonna break your legs. You know, that, that we, we managed to go on this journey and still do without having to you know, entertain that kind of risk where you're sort of experimenting over that, that, that kind of height. Because I would find that unacceptable. I, I think you're just you're just rolling a dice and hoping it's going to be fine. Where you have the one on your hand, you actually have a bucket that's got your fuel in it. Did you ever have like a fear of like your fuel exploding or being burned by the actual? Uh... Yeah, I should I should I should admit because I, I make a joke about that whenever I see that little clip come up. Um, there was actually a sealed like um, can in the bucket, <laughs> um, so it wasn't like sloshing around in the bucket. Because even for me, that would be a bit silly. I mean, I should say that um, it might come, come as a surprise to some people listening that actually the fuel, well, it won't come as a surprise that it's jet fuel, but it might come as a surprise that actually we can run just as well off diesel. Um, it's just a bit more smoky. Diesel is like a dirty version of jet fuel. Um, I don't at all suggest anybody ever does this, but you can actually drop matches into diesel and watch them go out. Diesel, uh, you know, is a very benign, unless it's very, very warm weather and you might get some degree of vapor off it. It's nothing approaching the danger of gasoline. If I had 20 liters of, you know, four or five gallons of gasoline on my back, I'd be very concerned. We've never split a fuel tank in four years of doing this. But if it was gasoline, I'd be perpetually concerned about that. It's basically diesel. Um, and also, OK, the engines are hot inside themselves. But how are you actually going to set fire to it? Because if the, the only real hot part of the engine you're near is the exhaust cone, except you've got a thousand miles an hour of air coming out of there. So to try and even get any of this very hard to ignite diesel near that hot exhaust cone is very hard. And even when you do, there's actually not an ignition source. So 
anyway, I, I, we, we do not at all disregard the fire risk. We take that very seriously. Um, but actually, it's when you de you know you know decompact it, if you're, you know uh, decompress the, the 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 risk, it's actually very manageable. When you were working as an oil trader, at least in the beginning, was it like a rush, like a high doing it? Um, yes, it was. I mean, it, trading for a big corporation is not like some sort of wolf of Wall Street, you know, gambling millions and seeing whether it comes up or not. You know, it, it's a lot more controlled and a lot more uh, conservative, let's say. But yeah, I mean, I remember putting on hedges the wrong way around and dropping a million dollars in five minutes and I remember, you know, calling the market right and calling the market wrong. And yeah, you do live a bit of a modest roller coaster of risk and reward and, uh, you know, excitement and somewhat misery. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's, there's been a lot written and described in the trading world. And there's a many, many different flavors of trading. And, uh, and yeah, it, I, I actually found the most interesting part of my old job was really the privilege that I had of going around to really exotic locations like Turkmenistan or Azerbaijan or Mozambique or Libya in Gaddafi's era and dealing with the national oil companies and, and oligarchs and all these kind of folks. And it was just such a privilege to be in rooms with people that you'd never normally get to meet. And, uh, and, and often just packing my trainers with me and at the end of a crazy day's meetings, going off and running in the countryside, like along the coast of Mozambique. I remember doing that. Who gets to do that? Um, so actually, it was, it was the people and the traveling and the relationships that were probably arguably more exciting um, of my, in my old life. When you thought of uh, actually the idea for building your, your suit, and you told your wife that you wanted to try to, you know, you had this, I don't know, I don't want to say crazy idea, but you had this idea to, oh, to, yeah. to build a no, suit. I'll take that. <laughs> Man, I mean, how, what was her response? Yeah, and, and again, I just sort of did it subtly. I, I don't know about you, but most, most projects, most ideas, you know, you don't literally wake up one day and suddenly everything shifts. You know, this, this was like, um, this was endless little sketchbook ideas on planes traveling with my old job. And getting probably overexcited about you know what if and how why not and maybe and all those sort of things, and, you know and I, and I very much firmly believe in trying to move off the sketch pad and onto something tangible. So the big step was buying the first little micro jet engine and starting to get to know how to use it and all its quirks and all the challenges around it and little modifications stuff we needed to make, um, and that was quite a learning journey. And then it was you know and and I suppose I explained to my wife you know I had this kind of idea about you know flight and. You know, it would be a fun experiment. I mean, she knows me well enough to know that I have lots of interesting phases of getting excited about stuff. I took up ultramarathon running. In fact, I'm wearing that T-shirt. One of those T-shirts right now it was an 85 miler. That was quite a painful thing. Um, you know, I, I, I like just taking on um, unusual challenges. The kind of thing when you look at it and go, you know, a bit like you, the Marine Corps by the sounds of it, you look at it at the beginning and think, God, oh, you know, I wonder if I can do that. I'm not sure I can do that. But if I can do that, that would be really quite rewarding. You know, it'd be quite an achievement. Uh, and and the more you think you can't do something and yet you go and try anyway, consequently, the more rewarding it is if it actually comes off. And so I had this sort of idea just needling me constantly about human flight. And uh, yeah, she was kind of fine with it. But as I say, we, we sort of layered into it over several months and sort of woke up uh, six months in, still doing my normal day job. And I did all this in evenings and weekends and very late nights. Um, you know, woke up with owning five or six of these jet engines, <laughs> realizing that this is probably, I'm in a bit deeper than I imagined. And, if it's not going to work, then my kids are going to have quite a lot of fun with jet engines being strapped to various bikes and go-karts uh, to try and rationalize why I bought them. But um, yeah, she knew what she was getting into, I think, when she, uh, she met me. <laughs> I like that plan B. You're going to put them on the kids' bikes. Those kids are probably like, yeah, dad, you're going to build a flying yeah. <laughs> do they want? Do they want to fly on in one? Well, so my boys now are 12 and 13. and My 13-year-old is the same height as me. And actually, even only three or four days ago, he had his latest go in it. He's only tried it three or four times. And he was actually bouncing around. Still, on the, you know, we're not, not going to take him off the tether, tether anytime soon. But he was bouncing around and not coming down very quick. In fact, I'm probably going to put some little clips on our Instagram uh, in the next 48 hours showing kind of where he's getting to. I have a hunch that despite him, you know, gosh, he's only 13. He is tall, but he's a classic gangly, you know, gangly 13-year-old. Uh, he doesn't have the bulk to be able to, just like any normal adult, so you know, you don't have to be at all very muscled to do this, but um, he just is quite slight. And um, despite though that, I think because this whole flying thing is about uh, the technique rather than strength, as long as he, as long as he uh, keeps practicing, I think he could actually get to fly this, which would be a pretty amazing thing to see a 13 year old fly a jet suit. 
I, don't know, I always see like kids like doing what their dads do, you know, like maybe they're playing basketball and the dad's like, you know, just destroying the kid. And then the next thing you know, the kid's just, just destroying the dad. Do you yeah, think, yeah. Do you, think you, you think your, your son's going to be out flying you here pretty soon? Or would yeah, that be oh, cool to be flying with him, you know? Yeah, no, that would be very cool. I mean, we had, um, so Bear Grylls uh, is a good friend and he came over to do some flight training with us. Uh, he can fly now. Uh, he, he learned very quickly, but actually... Uh, his eldest son, who I think is about 17, I forget exactly, Jesse, um, he actually watched avidly, intently, as his father went through about five or six goes. Each go is only about 90 seconds on the tether. It really doesn't take long to learn this. Um, but then guess what? Jesse's first go was brilliant. On his second go, he was flying around. He literally <laughs> nailed it within a cumulative about three minutes. Now, it was scrappy, but he did technically do it in his second go, just to beat dad, I think. You think it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, I used to kayak uh, in the ocean and, and, you know, when you're in a kayak, it's all your stomach muscles, you know, is the balance and everything. Do you yeah. think like having like a great sense of balance or confidence in balance uh, has a lot to do with how quickly people adapt or? Yeah, right. it's, it's not, not so much, not so much that, I mean, the core, core is useful, but it, it is mostly a gymnastic pilot type um, spatial awareness. So we find gymnasts, helicopter pilots, and Harrier pilots, actually, uh, but there's not many of them, but we've got a few in our team. Um, uh, helicopter pilots and gymnasts tend to be really good because in both cases, they have to listen to quite, you know, at some point when they were learning, they had to listen very intently. They had to body emulate um, what the uh, instructor was talking about. In the case of gymnastics, it really hurt if you didn't get it right. And you probably were doing all this as a kid. In the case of a helicopter pilot, it's really serious if you don't get it right. Um, and actually the whole not overcompensating relax let your kind of subconscious do most of the work you know when you're doing a triple somersault backflip and landing on your feet you can't consciously think of that that's your subconscious doing all the work you're just you're just a bit of a passenger saying i want to go and do this and land over there and and actually when you see helicopter pilots and i, I spent quite a few hours in helicopters and weirdly I, I i picked it up really quickly by applying the same rationale that we use to train people to fly a jet suit and it's this weird holding this weird stasis between um, conscious kind of competence, but it, but it, but a sort of unconscious competence at the same time. It's like not overthinking it, but being focused. If you just stare at your hand and think about what you're going to do and try and actually consciously think about your feet and your hands and, you know, this is for, for a helicopter, it's really hard. As soon as somebody says, oh, look at that over there, there's another helicopter, you know, you'll see that usually the helicopter will just flatten out and be really stable because they're actually distracted and their subconscious needs to be banging on the door the whole time saying, let me do this, actually is, is allowed in. Um, and I see that people learn to fly with us, the, the people who learn the quickest are the people who, in the first couple of goes, focus avidly on what they're doing and then consciously just let go and look around and grow, grin and just relax. And then they just find wherever they look, they go. And then after they never think about it again. A bit like a bicycle in a way. That's a not dissimilar process. If somebody asked you what you invented, what do you tell them? What did you invent, Richard? <laughs> I mean, we call it a jet suit. Um, I, I, it's not, it, it is supposed to be distinctly different from a jet pack. I mean, essentially, it's a pair of small jet engines like you'd find on a you know, jet fighter or airline. It's a small coffee jar sized uh, engines, one, one either side of each arm. So you've got four of them. Uh, the resulting thrust basically feels like it's going up your arm. So it's nice and kind of comfortable. And then there's another engine on your back. And between those five engines, you point them gradually downwards and you lift off and then miraculously your brain as you just heard me say within minutes can learn to actually vector in other words steer these arm engines around with very little effort to create the most ludicrous precision and control i i've drunk a cup of tea it's very british uh, and even eaten biscuits actually in the hover as somebody leaned out and actually fed me i mean i i've flown in gusting 45 mile an hour winds i've landed on cars and boats and ships and all sorts of things and it's all just down to your brain slightly re rewiring to use that arm vectoring process um and it and it's just it is i think the closest you can get to a kind of almost dreamlike or maybe if you want to go there superhero like flight experience you tried them on your legs and, and that didn't work but when you put it on your back first of all i didn't, i never even noticed there was one on the back but that mm -hmm. seems really genius does that really help you with stability does it give the exact amount of thrust is like what's going through your arms yeah, I mean, firstly, I would say I did achieve the very first flight, the very first six second flight with the engines on the back of my legs. But it was like being a puppet where you're da you know, dancing around with all four limbs kind of wanting to do something else. Um, it's quite nice when your legs just sort of dangle. Yes. Yeah, so if we sort of summarize the, the flight dynamics here, 
as I mentioned, because you've got a little engine either side of each arm, it's really the best alternative to sawing the end of your arm off and sticking one big engine where the stump is. <laughs> that would be the most elegant from a, <laughs> from a flight dynamics, dynamic point of view. So clearly we've gone to the next best option, which is as I described. Um, the one on the back is essentially the third leg of a tripod. You know, I, I'm talking to you now with this um, camera on a tripod and it's very stable because you've got three points of contact. If you, if you slow down or replay any of the clips of us flying, you can see you've got, you know, thrust out of one arm, thrust out of the other arm, and thrust out of the back. And those three tripod legs, um, as they're brought in tighter, you go up, and as they flare outwards, spread wider, that you go downwards. And as you manipulate any one of your arms, either of your arms, you then can change the, the way you drift or rotate, or you can move in the sort of five axis of freedom. Um, that rear engine does a great job of lifting all the fuel itself and about a third of your body weight, leaving only a third on each arm. And, I, and I, I'm, to, to help people kind of imagine what that's like is if you go into a bathroom or a kitchen, if you lean on your, we would call it a sink, you call it a faucet, I think, then you know, anyway, um, if you lean on a worktop or a table or something and you, you with roughly straight arms and you just keep leaning until you've got about two thirds of your body weight in your arms and you could stand on some bathroom scales and register this, you know, one third of your weight left on the bathroom scales you'll notice it's really easy. You could do it forever. I mean, it's just, you're just leaning. It's almost like you're just leaning on a, on a water cooler in an office. Um, that's all you're doing. You're just simply leaning. Everybody thinks it's going to rip your arms off, but no, you're just leaning. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought it, Terry, you even mentioned, you were saying like all these guys, they think it's got to tear your arms or whatever. And you're like, no, it just works. When I first watched, I thought, what about three? But you actually tried three on each arm, and what happened? You could do, uh, you'd want to have your arm right in the middle of the three. Uh, that means you've got an engine sort of between your arm and your body, which makes it a little hard to vector close to your body. Um, we try and minimize the weight on your arms as well. Um, there's some clever geometry built in, so actually when the engines are running, they lift themselves as well, so they don't really, you don't notice the weight. Um, but I, I, it works pretty well with two. I mean. If you ever have one of the engines not quite start up right and you go to take off, you really feel it cranking your arm around. So you really, you get to get a reminder of just how elegant it is that you fact you've got one either side. You know, in, in a good old sort of high school physics kind of diagram, the net resulting thrust is directly up your arm, save for the slight bleed off of the vector to lift its own weight. Um, it, it is a really elegant, well, we think it's a really elegant solution as, it, uh, you know, as we've got it. You know. I know that you only have a certain length of time that you're able to fly with the fuel that you have. Is really the ultimate goal to see how long you can fly or is it how safely long you can fly? Is that, is that always the ultimate goal? I, I mean, we're pushing at the limits of all of the parameters here, really. I mean, yes, range is one of them. You can tackle range in one of two ways. You can either hold a higher average speed and we set like an 85 mile an hour record uh, last year, especially using the leg wing. Um, so in the few minutes you have, you can go a hell of a long way at 85 miles an hour. Um, or you can add more power to lift more, more fuel, but you can only do that so far before you end up with such an enormous machine that you're, you're back to it being like a very crude helicopter. Um, you know, you, you're just a passenger if you're not careful. Um, but I mean, the option we really like is actually back to the leg wing I mentioned. If you can start to generate aerodynamic lift, you start to enter a really interesting world. And frankly, it's the world of the Harrier and the F-35. Those two aircraft, they use vector thrust control to lift off the ground, and then they can gradually vector that thrust backwards to start generating airflow and then actually generate lift in a much more efficient way. Um, we, we generate about 1.3 times the bo our body weight, you know, the flight weight, body weight and equipment weight in thrust, which we obviously have to, otherwise you wouldn't take off. We have to be more than one, otherwise you wouldn't take off. Most jet fighters are barely over one. So most jet fighters struggle for very long to sit on their tail. I mean, it's not a normal thing for a jet fighter to do. So it follows that if we, if we dial up the amount of aerodynamic lift we're generating, we don't need anywhere near the thrust that we're creating. So why not actually just, you know, almost throttle back to 20, 30% the engines, generate a whole load of lift from a crude set of wings that can fold out and cruise like that until you then fold the wings away crank the engines up, come back into a sort of burn hover, and then land again like we do now. That's all very doable, and that's some of the stuff we're working on behind the scenes. When did you decide to turn it into a business? Uh, your, your, your business is Gravity, and your yeah. website is gravity.co. Uh, yeah, get, yeah. yeah so, so, okay, so we started the journey in March 2016, got it to fly in November 2016, 
started to realize the handful of people we'd shown it to, because I kept it all secret, luckily. Um, this, the handful of people who saw it were kind of losing their minds with, with the impact it was having and it just didn't look kind of real. I, and I, despite you spending a lot of time, you know, kindly uh, looking at what we do, I guarantee you that we, you know, when you do see this live, it just blows people's minds. It looks like it's fake right in front of you. Your brain can't com compute. This should be possible. Um, uh, so that we were starting to notice that effect with a few people. And so we thought, you know what, rather than just stick with, you know, a, a one hit YouTube out there, why don't we just actually package this up in a brand that starts to communicate the why and the, you know, the maybe and the possibly, you know, and, and uh, starts to communicate more of the, of the context around what we're trying to do here. So uh, I took on a, a small investor who just, um, he put about a hundred thousand pounds in, well, $130,000 or so, which we spent on patenting it and um, got a plan together to, you know, form this brand Gravity, which I thought was a very neat idea, it wasn't my idea, um, and then worked up towards a launch in April 2017, really just to see what the world would make of it. And it ended up being launched around April Fool's Day, which was quite funny. So it hit like a billion impressions in three days. And I think a lot of people did think it was fake and then all came back and revisited it when it dawned on people it wasn't fake. I mean, a handful of people, I think, uh, persisted for about a year thinking it was fake. But anyway, um, but the phone just rang off the hook and um, I got a call to do you know, TED 2017, which is an amazing privilege. So I got on a plane. We'd never flown this thing out of uh, this farmyard that we borrowed around the corner from uh, where we live here in the UK. Um, put it all on, you know, check-in baggage, which was a bit of a surprise that no one stopped me and it was fine. Um, obviously no fuel. Um, stopped off in San Francisco, saw the Drapers, Adam and Tim Draper, they'd asked me to stop off at Boost VC at the, um, uh, you know, at their, um, uh, their VC firm there. And I, I, I'd said yes, A, because they sounded like a cool bunch, and B, because I wanted to test the gear before I basically fell over on my face in front of Richard Branson, Al Gore, and everybody in Ted. You know, it was quite a hot, sort of shit or bust kind of <laughs> outing. So anyway, I didn't really think much of it. There was about 30 or so VCs in this, in, and I wasn't trying to fundraise or anything. Did this very low fly around, really delighted it started. I think on the second attempt, because I had a bit of a air bubble in the fuel line. Um, I, I stowed the engines on my sides. Um, everybody went wild. Adam Tim rushed up and they pulled out a $100 bill and wrote me a $640,000 offer on that $100 bill for 10% of the company I just formed like, I don't know, a month earlier. So that week was going quite well at that point. <laughs> um, so we've not done a raise since. Uh, we went on to do TED. That went very well. I think I've done five, four or five uh, TED Talks now, including the TEDx ones. Um, and we've done 105 events in 31 countries in the three years before COVID struck. Um, because what dawned on us was that because you can stick all this gear into two check-in suitcases, you can go anywhere in the world and within... 20 minutes, get some diesel from the gas station and go and fly an event, whether it's opening a $100,000, you know, fee uh, um, uh, arena in um, uh, Tokyo, you know, where we launched the baseball season or a car launch in China or any number of events. We, we did Mark Zuckerberg's private investment um, thing, got to meet Mark there. We were due to do a thing with Bezos as well until COVID struck. Um, I, you know, I, I, I had a plan with Musk to do uh, his school, to fly to school. You know, we had... Uh, we, we, we generated, I think, about $4 million over three years from just doing events, which is like you're getting paid to generate PR and test the equipment in ludicrous places all over the world. Um, so that was brilliant. And then off the back of that, we also built the capacity, which is now growing really quickly, to train other people to come and do this. And then ultimately get to our race series, which I can tell you about if you like.